For quantum pagans, on the other hand, this stress upon such practices and paraphernalia was incredibly comforting. When Christian priests looked and behaved like pagan priests, when Christian saints resembled pagan gods and goddesses, when Christian statuary became like unto those in pagan temples, and when Christian rituals, practices and festivals came to be almost indistinguishable from their pagan counterparts, surface conversion and allegiance became an easy matter, but at the cost of much genuine belief and true spiritual growth. What the Church gained in being accommodating, in order to include large numbers of those for whom Christianity was at best an afterthought, she lost by diluting her original essence, and eventually found herself subverted by the very forces against which she had thought to protect herself with these policies. In the era of Pergamum, these problems were only incipient, but her overly generous toleration of these evil, non-Christian influences began a trend which would eventually shatter and transform the church visible. The problem with a fully integrated and unified church is that such an organization, being run by imperfect human beings, may well have the effect of spreading good usage and prohibiting heresy, but it can also have, and inevitably must have, again, because those who run it are imperfect and imperfection tends to breed more imperfection over time, have the opposite effect eventually, that is, of spreading heresy and prohibiting good usage. This dual trend towards centralization and accommodation would thus have, by the time of the late Middle Ages, the same effect that the Tower of Babel was intended to have in ancient times, the squelching of all true faith and practice, in the name of a unity that was becoming increasingly anti-God, in fact. That it took so many centuries for the rot to progress to the point of making the splitting off of most, if not all, true believers necessary for the perpetuation of the faith is a testimony to the faith and dedication of so many Christians who continued to labor in the only vineyard they knew in spite of ever-increasing problems. Christ's Self-Description This is what the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says. The image of the sword here stresses the need to make sharp distinctions between right and wrong, between true believers and phony ones. Do not think that I have come to hurl peace upon the earth. I have not come to hurl peace upon the earth, but a sword of divisiveness. For I have come to divide, so that a man will be set against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, with the result that a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Whoever loves his father or mother above me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves his son or daughter above me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. Whoever has found his life will lose it, and the one who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Matthew 10, 34 through 39 The sharp two-edged sword of Revelation 2.12 is to be understood in similar terms. Toleration of and accommodation with those minions of the evil one who had infiltrated the church was, as we have made the case, a recipe for disaster. The ruler of the church thus describes himself here in terms that remind us of his own policy of non-toleration of evil and non-accommodation with those who compromise the truth. We are to choose for him without reservation, or we are not worthy of him, as the Matthew passage makes clear. Later in the message to Pergamum, this impression is strengthened, as the offending believers are told by our Lord to repent of their attitude and practice of toleration of evil and compromising the truth, and also told that, if they do not take the admittedly hard decision to force out the cancerous elements in their midst, he himself will take matters into his own hands. In the same way, Paul had to deal harshly with the Corinthian church when they, in a very similar way, out of fear and a misplaced sense of tolerance, failed to take action when confronted with gross sinfulness, 1 Corinthians 5, 1-13. Those outside the church God will judge. You expel the wicked one from among you. Deuteronomy 17, 7. The necessity for believers to separate themselves from evil and evildoers is at the heart of experiential sanctification, the walk of righteousness to which we have all been called, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. By failing to separate ourselves from those who do wrong, we risk being drawn into their error as well. Do not be deceived, bad associations corrupt good behavior. 1 Corinthians 15.33 Christ's Particular Message 
You dwell where Satan's throne is. The Devil's throne, as we have seen in significant detail in the Satanic Rebellion series, is the earth, the kingdom which he wrested from Adam in the temptation and fall of Genesis chapter 3. Yes, the believers of Pergamum, and all believers since the fall and up until the establishment of Christ's millennial kingdom, do indeed dwell in the enemy territory of the kingdom of darkness, at least physically. Spiritually, however, we have been transferred into the kingdom of God's beloved Son, Colossians 1.13. Therefore, the adoption of a fortress mentality is entirely the wrong point of view for us who have chosen to follow the victorious king. This is even more the case given that the days of intense organized state persecution are by the era of Pergamum temporarily past. They would resurface in part from time to time, such as in the days of the Philadelphian era, but the next universal persecution of the church will not occur until the tribulation's second half. The enemy has already been defeated in principle, John 16:33, and the day of consummate victory is imminent, Revelation 19:11 through 21. The church is therefore not here to build bunkers, as the name Pergamum suggests the believers of that era had, but rather to adopt an offensive mindset, marching with the Lamb wherever he advances, Revelation 14, 4, and picking up our cross to follow him, Matthew 10, 38 and 16, 24. From a purely secular point of view, the pursuit of political power and strength is somewhat understandable in the context of Pergamum. In her days, after all, the Western Roman Empire came crashing to the ground, and what had been Roman territory was subjected to successive waves of barbarian invasions and regimes. From the spiritual point of view, however, the Church's survival and success never had a thing to do with the Roman Empire, originally hostile, then later sponsoring the Church visible. Our warfare is not an earthly one. We do not struggle against flesh and blood. Ephesians 6.12 but in the service and in the power of our Lord, as long as God is our refuge, we need no earthly citadel, Psalm 46, 1, and no fortification of the evil one which can stand against his church. And I tell you that you are Peter the little rock, Petros, and upon this mighty rock Petra, that is, upon Christ himself, I shall build my church, and the gates, that is, the fortified defences, of Hades, that is, the devil's kingdom, will not be able to resist it. Matthew 16, 18, 